Hi, everyone. This is Ariana Prasad with Pop Dust, and today we have a very special guest. We are speaking with Sujat Bhavay. She is awesome. Um, you probably know her from, uh, she was CC in Awkward Black Girl, um, and she was there on Insecure, and she directed a short, Cowboys and Indians, and she is coming out with her directorial debut, Definition Please. So, welcome, Sujat Hi, I'm so excited to be here. This is my first Facebook Live, so thank you for popping my Facebook Live cherry. Yeah, we're excited too. This is actually my first uh, Facebook Live as well, So, but welcome. Awesome, so uh, let's get into it. Um, so we were talking a little bit earlier, found out that we're actually both the Spelling Bee champs, and the main character in your film is a Spelling Bee champ. So I wanted to ask you, how much does this film mirror your own life? It's definitely not autobiographical, but it's a movie that's very personal to me. It, with every single one of my projects, I start with something real. So a bud of something real, and then I fictionalize it from that tiny little bud. So you mentioned that I was spelling bee champ. I really appreciate that because uh, at the time I was the fourth grade spelling bee champ, but it wasn't that big of a deal because there were only 10 people in my grade. Yeah. And I went to regionals and I lost in the first round on the word radish. And it was, <laughs> it was pretty, it was pretty heartbreaking in the moment, but my teacher was so amazing who had chaperoned me there. And she was like, it's okay. Like she was so supportive and so cool. And, and I didn't feel any pressure from my parents or my teachers or anything about winning or not winning. And I came back to school and my friends were just clowning me on losing on such an easy word. And honestly, they deserved to clown me because it was a very easy word. Right. And so back to the question, I definitely feel like there are parts of it that I've taken from my life or my friends' lives or family members' lives, but the entire thing is definitely not autobiographical. No, I totally understand. And uh, actually, I don't feel too bad because I misspelled hamburger in fourth grade. And I was extremely embarrassed. Like, how could I get that one wrong? Um, but anyway, so it happened. Wait, wait, wait. How did you, how did you spell okay. hamburger? So I spelled it hamburger. I was so confident. And then I just forgot the R. And they were like, wrong. And I'm like, what? Come on. I know how to spell hamburger. No, totally got it wrong. So I was out. But um, yeah, spelling bees were, of course, very fun as a kid. Um, so I can relate to that. And I just want to ask, like, what was, like, the rest of the, your process making this film? You know, bringing together the cast and getting funding. Like, how was that? I wrote out the sketch idea in a UCB sketch writing class, an improv class. And it was a four-page sketch entitled, Where Are They Now, Spelling Bee Winners? And if you Google the Spelling Bee Winners, they're all doing incredible, phenomenal things. Like, they are triple PhDs. They work at NASA. I'm sure a bunch of them are working on the COVID vaccine right now. The button of my sketch was that one of these spelling bee winners actually turns out to be a loser and <laughs> is not doing anything with her life. And so that was my four page sketch that I wrote in 2015. And then a couple years later in 2016, I went to the Sundance Screenwriting Lab with the project. And once you do one of the Sundance Labs, you're automatically considered alumni. So I decided in 2017 to go to the film festival for the very first time. And that was really exciting for me. I'd never been to Sundance before. And when the Sundance uh, people found out that I was going, they asked me to be a Sundance influencer. <laughs> so I got to take over their Instagram and their Twitter and go to really cool events. And I was so lucky to go to Sundance for the first time, but also have an insider point of view with it. And my friend Justin Chan's film was premiering that year in 2017 called Gook. So I went to the premiere of Gook and I was blown away. Such an amazing film. If you haven't seen it, go see it. I, I'm pretty sure it's on one of the streamers right now. And I asked him right after, I was like, how'd you get this movie made? Like, how, how did you make it happen? He was just like, I just did it. I wrote it. I knew I was going to be in it. I asked my friends and family for financing and I just made it happen. And I was like, that's what I'm going to do. So 20, middle of 2017, I started writing the feature film version of Definition Please. And, and it was based on that initial idea of this spelling bee winner turning out to be a loser when she becomes an adult. But 
I wanted to explore why, what are those reasons? And for me, the answers were her fa family relationships. So it was her relationship with her parents. It was her relationship with her brother. And the, the title definition, please, is not only a nod to spelling bees, but it's also defining your life. So how does Monica, the lead character, define her life in terms of the people around her? And in the end, how does she define herself on her own terms? Yeah, that's great. I actually didn't uh, make that connection, but I appreciate that because now I'm looking back at the film and thinking it is, you know, a journey of self-discovery and she learns to define herself in new ways. I do want to touch on that. Of course, there's so many themes in this film that, can, that a lot of us Asian Americans and South Asian Americans can connect with. So, you know, I feel like there's sometimes this divide, like we want to build these careers and sometimes our parents want certain careers for us, but there's also an expectation like to care for our family and grandparents. And I feel like it's difficult to combine these two, you know, thinking you have this busy life or you want to build into this career, but you know, it's almost feeling like there's these things holding you back. And in a way, I'm Monica or Booty, you know, um, but she uh, is judged at certain points in the film and starts to judge herself, right? So. Um, yeah, like, can you talk about that a little bit? I'll just say, like, first and foremost, I am a model minority because I got my engineering degree. <laughs> and I was yeah. really good at science and math and spelling and English and reading and writing. And so part of that for me was exploring how that's different for all of us. And, yeah. and us, you know, even if you're good at something, is that necessarily what you want to do for the rest of your life? Is that necessarily what you will be happy with doing? And, and are you making yourself happy or are you making your parents happy? And filled with this, you know, a lot of our parents sacrificed a lot to come to America. And so you, you kind of just have it in your head like, oh, well, well, I have to do better than them, even if they're not telling you that. So, so that's something that I wanted to explore in the film because I also had that where I graduated with an engineering degree and then I got an amazing job at a consulting firm and was making tons of cash. And, and I knew this wasn't it. I knew for me it wasn't going to be about the money. And so I, I really took the steps to go into entertainment, to go into acting and writing and and that's something that everyone has to decide for themselves. And luckily my parents were very supportive and they, they always were supportive when I was doing middle school plays and musicals and all through high school, they would come to my shows every single night for the entire five night run and bring flowers. And, and they would always read my, my scripts and my poems and, and they loved my songs that I created and so it was, it, it's one of those things that I wanted to explore because I, one of my cousins has very strict parents. And I think that's, yeah. that's something that we deal with as well. You know, you have the liberal parents and you have the strict parents yeah. who are like, no, you have to be a doctor. You have to be an engineer. Maybe we'll allow you to be a lawyer or a financial analyst. And so I just wanted to explore all different facets of that in the film in terms of you see that the mom character is actually pretty cool. And, and that's a little bit based on my own mom who is super chill and has always been supportive. And, right. and then you see it with the tiger mom character as well. That's the different side of the coin. Yeah. Um, Pyle's mother is very strict and wants her to do the spelling bee, even though she's definitely not ready for the spelling bee. So I wanted to explore because we're all different kinds of people and I wanted to explore all of that. We're not just one stereotype. So that was important for me to show in the film. But yeah, but I think that your film, of course, can uh, anyone can relate to it. But as far as brand rep rep parents getting a bad reputation, I feel like sometimes we forget that they have actually immigrated here and have already undergone so much change. So they are actually capable of more change. And I think you really show that in your film. Yeah, they definitely are. And I think, I think it's exciting to watch them change and, and be aware of that. And in the moment, uh, you can kind of see in my film as well, you can watch the mom change throughout the film, especially, you know, when she's with her friends. And so it's really exciting 
watch a person's mind open up to bigger ideas. And I think that's always lovely to portray. And as far as like, sometimes, you know, I guess we can say overall, uh, whether they're strict or not. So I think a lot of brown parents struggle with like uh, dealing with mental health with our generation, you know, when their kids are going through these issues or sometimes the depression, it's like, you have everything here. I don't understand. What did we do wrong? And we actually see that in your film. And I've heard that a lot. It's okay. Maybe we made mistake. It was amazing that, you know, the mom apologized because a lot of parents don't. It's I gave you everything or, you, you know, I, I did all this for you. So what is your problem? I don't understand your unhappiness. You know, it's like this just depression's not understood. So, um, yeah, like how was that like uh, portraying that in the film? And, you know, I, I love like uh, Monica's face in a lot of those scenes, right? You just see this shock and awe when she's seeing her brother kind of fall apart, you know? And I just feel like there's so much emotion there because no one in Brown families really knows how to deal with mental health. Yeah, mental health was definitely one of the main things in my film. And you, in the beginning, you don't really know what's going on. And you're like, oh, why is she so mean to her brother? Yeah, <laughs> and and yeah. then you slowly realize what's happening. And, you know, I was, uh, I grew up in a very white suburban town in the middle of Pennsylvania, but I will say I was lucky in that there are three temples in Pittsburgh. So I would be hanging out with my white friends at school, but then on the weekends, and on Sundays, I would be at Indian parties, garbas, uh, doing Bharatanatyam at the temple, uh, going to Hindu temple summer camp. And so I had a really great posse of Indian friends. Now, within that posse, and even some of our acquaintances, there were cases of mental illness, and people were just, like, not mm -hmm. talking about it. So, oh, yeah. like, one of our friends ran away from home. And his parents were like, uh, were like, what, what happened? Why isn't, uh, uh, we gave Anna and everything he needed. He's doing so good in school. And, and this was like 10th grade, you know, PSATs or SATs. And, and okay. everyone was getting super stressed out because the parents would be talking about SAT scores and what college they were looking at. And if it wasn't an Ivy League, then they're a failure. So I wanted to really connect the idea of being a model minority leading to mental illness or, you know, just mental illness in general. And I wanted to portray it in a very authentic way. So I did a lot of research. I have extended family members with mental illness and consulted with doctors and psychiatrists to really get that story correct. It's really important in our community Indian American community and Asian American community in general to speak openly about these issues and not keep them secret. And, and something that I see in our communities is we only talk about the positive things that are happening. Oh, my daughter's getting married. My son is having twins. He just got a promotion at, I don't know, whatever thing on Wall Street. And it's important to also talk about, you know, other issues that affect all of us. And mental illness is one of them, depression, bipolar, anxiety, especially with the current situation of us being isolated from other people. How is that affecting our mental illness? I think that's really important to talk about in this moment as well. Oh yeah, definitely. And I just wanna say like, I do see in films sometimes, I feel like, uh, especially when people are portraying things like bipolar disorder, and I understand the character had BPD, but which I feel like is not represented much at all, but it was in your film represented very well. I think you did a fantastic job. I wanna thank you for that. Cause of course, when we have the moment to shine, it's so important that we get it right. So, you know, thank you for just, it, it was such an honest portrayal. But the other thing that was so honest in your film is the family dy dynamics. As you said, first, uh, Monica seems, she seems mean, right, uh, to her brother and her mom said, please get along with your brother, which is a common reaction, you know. Oh, you said you guys fight and it's never like an analysis of what's really going on or let's, yeah, I, I just felt like that was really honest. And I want to ask you, like, because we're Indian American, we kind of have a mix of both worlds, you know, there's the hands-off approach. And then I feel like the American approach is, push pills at it sometimes, which has its own, you know, kind of negative. It's okay. Yeah. They need medication. They need medication. And we see that too. But I also feel in your film, um, I don't want to do any spoilers, but there is of course this idea of let's actually heal and have an emotional bond. So how do you think as we as 
Indian Americans can lead that charge to address mental health in a different way. I think it's all about, you know, us looking at mental illness in the same manner as a physical ailment. So if you break your leg, your parents are going to take you to the hospital and you're going to get a cast. So if you are feeling anxious and depressed, that's physical as well. And so you have to go to a therapist and you have to talk about your problems and maybe that's all you need. Maybe that's, that's it. But then if there is a need for, you know, chemical pills and stuff, then, then you also figure that out as well. So, so it's all, I think it's all just programming your mind to think about mental illness in a different way, the same as, you know, getting sick or the same as, um, I don't know, getting a bump on your elbow and, and putting a Band-Aid on it. So, so let's, let's learn how to talk about getting that Band-Aid on mental illness and be able to communicate about that. I, I also wanted to, you know, give a huge shout out to Ritesh Rajan, who plays Sonny in the film, because, uh, I mean, he just really got it right away. He did a lot of his own research. His, his, apparently his entire family was doctors. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he talked to um, all of his family members and he consulted with a psychiatrist and, and talked about the medication part of it. And he really brought so much to the table. He gave 110% and, and I couldn't have done what we did without him and his performance and even uh, in pre-production when we were having rehearsals at my apartment in Los Angeles before flying out to Pennsylvania, uh, he, he came over and I was just ready to do just a very cold table read of our scenes. And he was like bawling on my couch. And I was like, oh shit, like I gotta, <laughs> I got to like get up to this guy's level in terms of acting. So he made me a better actor. And I think that's one of those secrets that you want to put out there is that always surround yourself with people who are more talented than you. And then they'll make you look better, which is definitely what happened to me in terms of how I cast the film and my entire crew. Yeah, so how, how did you find all of this fantastic South Asian talent? I mean, uh, Ritesh was amazing. I mean, he, I feel like, embodied the character. But the mom as well, you know, she was incredible. I mean, I just feel like all the characters were them. They don't even feel like actors, you know? So how, how did you go about finding all this talent? Well, first of all, they're all actors, and they're amazing. So, <laughs> so they definitely put a lot of work into yeah. the project and the research and everything. But But I'm lucky to be a part of a really cool South Asian entertainment community in Los Angeles. And honestly, I, I, as an actor myself, I don't love auditions. And I know that I don't do my best in the audition scenario. And I do my best when I'm just on set and everything around me is uh, part of the character and I'm in the character's clothes and I've got the character's hair and makeup. And so I was very confident in texting my friends and asking them if they wanted to play the role, asking them if they would read the script and look at the role and consider it. And because I already knew that they were capable of it. And so that's something that I was very uh, excited about because I could just contact these really talented people in my immediate, uh, you know, friend circle who, we're just like ready to play and and Tesh was really excited because he he had never done a role like this before and and Anna which I think she read the script in one night and she was like uh said yes and she said she had never read a mom character like this before who who was really cool and not controlling yeah. and and listened and and has yeah. this clear amazing arc in the film as well and so I, 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 I got really excited when my actors got excited about the film. And I was like, oh, like this is, the, we, we have something here. Something special is happening. And so that was really exciting. And even for the, the smaller cameos, I mean, Sonal Shah killed it as uh, <laughs> the mom's friend, as Dr. Ali. 
And, mm -hmm. and even like during shooting, I was like, she's stealing the movie. And I was so excited about that because I, I, I knew I wanted to balance uh, the, the kind of the, the sadder moments with laughter because that's life, you know, life is not yeah. all, uh, you know, happy and life is not all sad. So I wanted to make sure that my movie portrayed uh, life as it is, which is like, you know, you have your serious moments, but then you have a Dr. Ali who's, <laughs> who's you know, this awesome character. And then we had Parvesh China come in and we had uh, Jake Choi, you know, which was really cool to cast an Asian American male romantic love interest. And um, so, yeah, it, was, it really was just a whole bunch of friends coming together to make this happen. And I appreciate all of their time and energy that they put into it. Yeah, that's awesome. It sounds like you're building a coalition in Hollywood. So. <laughs> yeah, you um, know, if you, if you see, like, if you look at Hollywood itself, you know, like, everyone always works with this. Like, who, Judd Apatow works with all the same actors, right? Right. And, you know, if you watch uh, David Lynch films, like Twin Peaks and stuff, it's all the same actors over and over again. Yep. And, and it's really incredible. So, you know, I think it's important for us to also make that, a, a similar coalition and then we just get to make the same movies and TV shows with with all of our friends over and over and that's that's the dream that's the Hollywood dream yeah definitely and tell the stories you want um so I, when I see you guys around I'm gonna call you guys like the Sujata squad or something so Ooh, <laughs> but, I like that. you like that I like that. I've heard that before that's nice <laughs> all right all right yeah so but um, no, but I'm really excited for all of you guys. Of course, there's gonna be good things ahead. Um, I do wanna ask, cause it's actually pretty cool. So I was doing my research and I realized that the, this film actually takes place in your hometown. So I know you drew things from like your own life and everything. I'm also from a small town. So, and I was thinking that um, I feel like basically who grow up in larger cities and big communities and they have all this thing, they have their own unique experience. And then there's those of us who grow up in small towns all across the United States. So a lot of times we're isolated in our own way. We have very unique experiences, right? Um, so uh, yeah, can you speak to that as to how like your film might speak to small town daisies? Yeah, you know, I really get excited about films in general that take place in small towns that aren't New York or LA. And you know, I, lo I live in LA, I love LA. This is one of the best places in the world. Um, but I'm also obsessed with my hometown, <laughs> Greensburg. And, and I have, you know, my best friends from school. One of them is from preschool, who's still a good friend of mine. And she actually was in, I didn't know English when I started preschool. I okay. only knew Bengali. And okay her mom was my preschool teacher and she made her play with me because I was just like <laughs> sitting in the corner co coloring and not talking to anyone because I didn't know the language and so she would come over and color with me and we're still friends to this day and then my other friend from back home uh, is a friend from second grade so we're all still like this squad from back home and and I had just an amazing childhood growing up in a small town and, and, and it didn't matter like going to an all white school like that. It was never a, you know, I, I don't, maybe I've like sh shut it out, but I don't remember having any like racist experiences. Uh, mm -hmm. It was more from like, I don't know, like in seventh grade, I was in my math class and my teacher like looked at my name during roll call and was like, Su and I was like, Sujata. <laughs> and then she was like, she was like, can I call you Sue? And I was like, no, no, you can't call me Sue. Do I look like a Sue? Um, a lot of my friends call me Suj, which feels more appropriate than Sue. So, so, you know, there were those moments, but then, like I said, we in Pittsburgh, Monroeville area, there are three temples. And so yeah. I was really connected to my culture and I did go to Parthnathiam every Sunday at the temple and I did go to Hindu temple summer camp every summer. I had, I went to Garbas. I went to, you know, we would do so many things with our Indian community. My mom hosted Thanksgiving every year 
at our house for the Bengali American community. And to this day, people from Greensburg, Pittsburgh area talk about the Thanksgivings at our house because all of us, you know, all of our extended families were in India. So we made our own family in Pennsylvania. And it, it was actually really lovely, you know, like I, I ha have never had that like confused Desi mindset because okay. I've, I've just had the best of all the worlds that were given to me. And um, so, so it was really important for me to kind of showcase small town Indian American family, because even in uh, indie films that I'm inspired by that, you know, predominantly have white characters. So like the Duplass yeah. brothers films or uh, yeah. some films that I watch that have very specific sibling relationships, which are, you can count on me and skeleton twins and the savages they they're all pretty much in small towns and i and i love the the idea of a small town and that's why i i love greensburg and i love going back home and you know i love shopping at gabe's when i go back home and it's just uh it's just really special to me yeah um i definitely i know like when i was growing up i kind of had like a love hate relationship with my hometown i grew up in uh, opelousas louisiana but um so i but i also like I've had uh, childhood friends and everything. I mean, I remember just after like a Mardi Gras parade, making friends on the playground with one of, you know, so it was like in third grade, we're still friends to this day. But I, I guess one thing I think about is, I feel like there's this idea that, especially in the South, but small towns, if people are closed-minded, and I feel like maybe we can speak to that. You're actually surprised because there's a lot of open-minded people all over the United States. And I feel like small towns kind of get a bad reputation, you know? Oh yeah, I I do feel like small towns get a bad reputation because I I like I said like I didn't have any issues growing up in a small town and um, something me and my friends talk about all the time is that we we always made our own adventures and we we kind of were leaders of our, our own adventures and people would want to come along with us and uh, which was really exciting because like it was never. Uh, led by boys like we were never like oh let's go join the boys like the boys would want to be on our, our <laughs> adventures which was really weird because but but we were like yeah we're fun we're fun and we're smart and we rule the school and that's that's kind of that so so it was I feel like small towns are kind of cool in a way that you can you know you can cater it to be whatever you want it to be because I went to a huge school it was like 2,000 kids in my high school oh, wow. um and I was coming from eight years of Catholic school where once again I said there's like 10 people in my grade so you just kind of I'm I'm super good at adapting in whatever yeah. situation that I'm in and I think that's really important to keep in mind in terms of small towns and the people in small towns generally aren't exposed to certain things and then when they are exposed they're like oh that's cool yeah. that's like not what I thought this person was gonna yeah. be like so it's almost like we just need to you know make movies like definition please that yeah. people can watch in these small towns and something that's been exciting with the film is that we premiered at Bensonville Film Festival which is in Arkansas and then yeah. coming up we're playing at Twin Cities Film Fest which is another kind of small townish you know so it's really exciting that all these uh, that all these towns are playing the film for their communities because I think those are the communities that need to see it the most. Yeah, and I think it is relatable. Like you know, as we're saying, like it's kind of underestimated. We even see in your film, like you know, her best friend is white, and then the love interest is Asian. So it's like all these people are coming together in this town. It's not that shocking or surprising, you know. Um, so Lelaine, Lelaine is half Filipina. Oh. Oh, okay. I'm oh, cool. <laughs> awesome. No, that's and cool. she and she played the. I don't know if you watched Lizzie McGuire, but she played the best friend in <gasps> Lizzie McGuire. She she looks so familiar. Okay, I was wondering. Okay, that is cool. And wow, I didn't know she's half Filipino. So that is dope. But yeah, she, it, she she came all back to, She yes. came back to entertainment for my movie. <laughs> Are you serious? That's amazing. Well, she yeah. did a fantastic job. Wow. She's incredible. Okay. <laughs> and, and she was also, she was also one of, you know, she was in my friend circle and 
and I didn't audition her. I just knew that she could do it. Hello, she yes. was on Lizzie McGuire. And, oh. and I knew that she hadn't acted in a while. And, and I, just, I just felt like she would be great at it. And she just came in and nailed it. And it was, it was so lovely. So, yeah. So are you convincing her to come back into acting or? I mean, I don't know. I think she's very specific <laughs> about the project she chooses. Of course. Um, yeah. But I don't know if, if that soul. opens the door for her to do yeah. other other projects. I'm I'd be so excited. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I'll be looking. At, maybe she'll join the squad. You know. And you yeah. Guys can... <laughs> she's, ar she's already in the squad. Yeah, she's if on you, the squad. If you're in definition, please. Yeah. When you're in the squad. Yes. Yeah. You're in the squad. Um, and actually, like your adventures, I know you draw from your own life and it inspires new projects. I would love to see one of your badass, like, high school adventures. Uh, <laughs> that sounds like an awesome, like, coming-of-age film. Um, just putting that out there. But, uh, no, that's really cool. I'm really glad that you had that experience, you know. Um, I'll, just I know, like, that, a lot of I'll just say that those adventures would not be a Disney film. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, hey, yeah. I'll still watch. <laughs> but, um... I feel like, you know, it's easy to kind of talk about the struggles that we go through, but I, as we're saying, like, there's so many positives, and, you know, it's awesome to be Indian American, obviously, but um, I do want to talk in the film, and I'm glad that you didn't go through it. I didn't go through that much either, but the bullying, I did want to talk about that, because it's interesting, you see, you see it with a young uh, Indian American girl, so girls go through different things than boys, and then you see the effect of, on, of bullying on an adult man, you know, so... Can you talk about like all the different kinds of bullying that our community goes through? Yeah, I, I feel like when, when you're, I'll talk about the adult man bullying first, because I feel like that's more of an interior monologue that you yeah. feel, which is like, not necessarily, maybe it's a passive aggressive thing that happens at dinner parties yeah. about like, oh, well, you know, I got married to you know the hottest girl in high school and now we're we're pregnant we're about to have babies um and then you take that information and you're like mm. oh my gosh I should be in that right stage of my life and so mm. I think it, when you're older it's more of a passive bullying as opposed to you know right off the bat like this is yeah you know I'm calling you a right. bad name and so with the kids situation uh, I did go through a phase in sixth grade where I like switched to a new Catholic school and, and sixth grade was just like the worst like school year of my life in terms of like, nobody wanted to talk to me. I did a Parthenotheum performance for the talent show <laughs> and I won first place, but people were like, oh, she only won because she did this Indian thing, you know? And I was like, I'm actually oh, shocked God. that this, this, it, this Catholic school allowed me to perform like a Barth nothing <laughs> <laughs> performance for the talent show. And so I, I like yeah. could hear, I could hear her talking about me and being like, oh, she didn't deserve that. So, so I yeah. definitely pulled from that, like one teeny stage in my life where like in seventh grade, I switched to public school and everything was cool. <laughs> but like sixth grade, <laughs> I had that like little yeah. kind of mean girl type bullying situation and it was because of what I was proud of and who I was it was right, because of right. my Indian dancing and so I wanted to kind of just throw that in there in terms of like you know this is what some some kids face you know at school and what how can they how can they deal with it and especially when you are not a model minority and you're supposed to be smart and at the top of your class and you're not and these kids are calling you dumb and I wanted to tackle that head on and you know I also my character also tackles that head on in the film <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's actually an interesting thing because you see that like with the younger character her mom is pushing her and as you pointed out your mom in the film is actually so relaxed but and then you know she, uh, she gets criticized for it later you know how oh uh the the other mom, the competitive mom is saying, oh, well, your mom just let you run wild and this is why you're a loser today, you know? And so it's interesting, like, you know, the kid that wasn't pushed actually did so much better. And then the kid that was being pushed on so much, all I was doing was really causing anxiety, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I said, yeah, and I saw that happening with my cousin who was pushed and pushed and pushed. And then when she went to college, it was like, 
she just went wild. And I was like, what do you, you need to like, be careful. And I was, right. you know, I was the wild one in like middle school and high school, but it was like yeah. a very contained, safe kind of wild. Yeah. Whereas like, she was not putting herself in safe situations. And it was because she, it was oh, yeah. the first time away from home, the first time oh, yeah. away from her strict parents. And I was like, you gotta, you gotta figure yourself out. You know, and I couldn't believe that I was being the voice of reason for my cousin, yeah. you know, but I, I knew right. I could see what was happening psychologically. You know, I could see that, you know, her parents never let her go to school dances. Her parents never let her yeah. go to sleepovers. And I was allowed to do all of that. Yeah. You know, at the, at yeah. the age of 10, I was like going to the dances and my dad was helping me shop for like a dress for the formal or, you know, so... So I, I could definitely see the opposite happening to my cousin. And um, I wanted to show how that is not, you know, it's not like the super best thing to do in terms of having kids. Yeah, definitely. Um, I feel like, uh, I mean, of course, it's hard to parent, but you need to give them the space to kind of come into their own and become their own adults, you know? Um, so yeah, when you're putting all that pressure, then they're just going to run wild. I've seen that too, of course. Yeah. Uh, like and I, I see know it, I see it. a lot more sheltered. Exactly. I was just going to say, I yeah. see it a lot, it's especially yeah. with South Asian kids where like, I, even when I went to college, I went to Case Western in Cleveland and there were, you know, it's a tech engineering science school. Everyone's either oh. pre-med or engineering. Yep. My God, like these Indian girls were just like going fuck wild. And I was like, yep. What if I just kind of want to stay in my dorm room and like read my book and like maybe if yeah. I like go hang out it'll be but they were going buck wild right. so 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 I definitely wanted to you know just touch on that a bit in definition please for sure okay so I do want to say that I feel like overall your film is like a huge inspiration to brown girls everywhere so if there is like any kind of advice or tidbits I feel like we've touched on so much today but is there anything specific for you know even maybe someone who's in engineering right now and is watching this and says you know what I really want to do film or I really want to do art you know what would your advice be in like well, first of all, I'm not going to tell you to like quit your job, <laughs> especially in this economy, like, like stay at your engineering job and stay at your consulting gig. But I will say there's so much opportunity to create right now. I mean, you, the stuff that I'm seeing on TikTok from South Asian creators is, is mind blowing and so great. And I, I, I just like am obsessed with it and you can make, little videos on your phone and put them on YouTube or put them on IGTV. And there's such a great, you know, like use the internet, use the video that you have on your phone to create. And also don't be afraid to make mistakes. I think that's one of the biggest things that we deal with as South Asians is that we want to be perfect. You have to let go of that and you have to create without you know, judging yourself without censoring yourself. And, you know, if the first like three videos that you make, they don't get any hits or whatever, keep making videos, like don't stop. So I've made a lot of web series and sketches and stuff that haven't gotten any views, haven't gotten any hits, but I continue to make and I continue to create. And even if that, that one like two minute sketch didn't get the views, guess what? It like got me a manager or it got me an agent or something else happened out of that little thing. So I really believe we have to get out of our own ways to put our content out there because there are so many ways to put it out, put it on Facebook, what we're doing right now, you know? So yeah. it's, it's really important and just, you know, just do it. Yeah, I think it's a little bit nerve wracking, especially if you're with social media, there's an anxiety, like if this doesn't get likes, but at, like a live thing, like, you know, we haven't done live interviews. Now when we do the next one, we're a little bit more used to it, you know, so you just have to get out there and do it. And I actually just want to touch on, um, I think a really important thing is connections. Cause I remember actually, you followed me on Twitter a few years ago and I remember I was like freaking out. I was like, oh my God, Sujata followed me. Like, why do I deserve this? This is so dope, you know, like. And then um, you had like reached out to me and, you know, told me about what you were doing now. And, you know, it's like, we didn't know each other, this wouldn't have happened. So I feel like it's 
really important to make connections. And I feel like South Asians are so open to helping. You know, I just watched this thing from SAJA, the South Asian Journalism Association. They're these sports broadcasters doing like a little video talk and they put all their emails out there, you know, so like people want to help, you know. So if you're South Asian, you want to get in these creative fields, like do what you can to reach out to people. For sure. For sure. Yeah, it's really important. I've made so many connections. I mean, I met Issa Rae through Twitter over eight years ago. And that's how I, that's how I got on Awkward Black Girl. So I (laughs) I will never, ever diss social media because I think it has done so much in terms of voices of color and putting them out there that it's just been a boon to the industry. Yeah. And I I mean, I feel like Awkward Black Girl and everything that you went through and the career you've built, it built to what you built today in definition, please. Um, I just want to thank you so much, Sujata, for giving us your time and this amazing conversation. And yeah, um, so check out Definition, please. When will we be releasing everywhere? So we're doing the film festival circuit right now. The next two film festivals we're at are Twin Cities Film Fest and Asian Cinevision. And we do not have a public release yet, but we are talking to buyers right now. Okay, awesome. Well, it will definitely be out there and we will keep you updated. We're gonna be doing a write-up as well on her film to give you more of a sneak peek on what it's about. Thank you so much to Sujata and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Ariana. This was great.